All right, it's recording. You got the new 15-inch Mixer Pro right now? Yeah, I already had it. Um, I just decided to bring it. This is how you find it easily. It's usually my massage chair laptop at the house. <laughs> <laughs> Um, actually, it's funny. Yesterday, I was, uh, I installed, uh, got a Windows environment set up on here, and, um, with VMware, and initially, uh, VMware has a setting turned on for, uh, um, match the retina display resolution. I'll tell you what, Windows 8 is not made for a super high resolution screen. I couldn't even function. Everything was so tiny. So I had to like turn it off and like dumb down the resolution in order for it to even like be usable. It's kind of funny actually. Um, okay. Well, let me get. Is it two fifty? Well, yeah, sometimes people set up the same backgrounds on multiple machines. Like, has the same background on everything? <laughs> That's completely new. This doesn't look very promising. Oh, I bet you it's, uh, here we go. There it is. This should be much more promising. Okay. So, last time, we built this little form builder thing. Oh, this is actually from a different, uh, it's from my grad class. Oh, can somebody get the lights, please? So we built this form builder object, and what the form builder uh, did is when we first created uh, it, we went ahead and set up our input. Um, and what we were doing is building an HTML page, right? Uh, and ultimately, we would actually build a form that had, you know, so many input boxes and things like that. So it allowed us to solve a problem very similar to problems that we solve in real life. So if I run this real quick, you know, we'll enter the page title. So we're going to say test page. Uh, we're going to go ahead and add a label and the label is going to be username colon. We'll add a text field and it's uh, uh, name will be username. We'll add another label uh, and we'll say password colon. Then we'll add a password field. Um, and the field name is going to be password. I didn't put any line breaks in here. We'll add one now. So the username and password are right next to each other. Um, then we will say done. What do you want the submit button to say? We'll say login. And it outputs for us some HTML code. So I'll copy that. We'll go ahead and open up text edit. It. I'll create a new document. Make it plain text. Paste all that HTML code in there. Okay, so that's what was produced by our program. I'll go ahead and save this to the desktop. And we'll call this guy blah.html. Okay, now I'll go ahead and create one more desktop here. And I'll double click on this and it should open it up in Safari. And there's our page that was created for us. All right, so we have a little tool that allows us to generate web forms. Okay. Um, now, did we talk about, uh, we talked about XML a little bit last time, right? Did I talk about XML, JSON, anything like that? Okay. 
So let's take this a step further. Um, so what I really wanted to show last time is this idea that we can take, as, as computer scientists, we can take a problem that other people need to solve by hand. They need to go into Notepad and actually create an HTML document like this by hand. Uh, they can go and they can use uh, another tool. Uh, for example, um, I'll open up Dreamweaver here. So this is like a common... Uh, um, maybe professional web development tool somebody might use. Uh, we'll create a new HTML page. Gives me something that looks like this. We're in design mode right now. So I'll go ahead and insert a form. Then I'll insert a label, the label say username, then I'll insert a text field, text field's ID is username, oh you could actually, have a, I could have associated a label with that, um, I'll do a line break, actually let's just make it identical, so I'll insert another I guess it wants to do it as a text field. Um, ID is password, label will be password, colon. Um, where do I make it password protected? No, not that important. So I'll just come into the code here and I'll change the uh, Type on that to password. Okay, we'll go back to just design mode. I'll press enter to kick us down to the next line. We'll go to insert a um, button. Uh, we don't even need to give it an ID. We'll just call this guy login. And just hit okay. Oh, that's and that'll submit the form, so that's that's fine. Okay, so we just built that same web page. Now, which took less time? The Dreamweaver took less time. I guarantee that took me longer to do than it took us to build the same exact thing with our Java program, didn't it? This was more graphical. You know, we could teach a monkey how to do this one, right? But the point is, is that this tool is made for, you know, I would say the generalistic web developer, which doesn't necessarily mean that person's a worse programmer, but more people can do web development that can do general purpose development. I think that's a relatively fair statement. If you are a general purpose developer like a Java programmer or an Objective-C programmer or a C-sharp programmer, chances are you can transition to web development pretty easily. Um, being a web developer doesn't necessarily mean you have the background to easily transition to these other things. You know, so I might, on a pecking order, say a web developer is a little bit lower on the development side of things than a generalistic programmer, they might be on a little bit higher end of a graphical user interface side of things. So web developers tend to be able to make things look nicer. Um, so maybe that's the trade-off. But in any case, Dreamweaver is a tool that a lot of professional web developers might use. They would build a form kind of like we just did. Well, we built that same form using our Java program, and it created an output that looked like that. And it took us a lot less time. It was a junkier interface, right? I mean, you go back to Eclipse here, and we were, you know, we <laughs> had a little text-based menu-driven thing, where we pressed zeros and ones and things like that, but at the end of the day, didn't it actually produce a solution more quickly? So if we're building web forms pretty often, just as an example, something like this can be highly beneficial, correct? And now with our background, we have a tool that we can sit there and, you know, I promise you, when you get better at this, you could have written this program in 20 minutes. So you write this program in 20 minutes, 
um, or even less, but let's just say 20 minutes comfortably while you're watching a TV show or something like that. So you write this program in 20 minutes, and then you go and create 30 web forms in a fraction of the amount of time it would have taken you to create those web forms individually, even using Dreamweaver. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's one of the tools that we have as programmers. So I like to come back to this example. Um, something I say at the beginning of almost all the classes in here, we get this concept in computer science that we think programming is computer science. And I would say that's, that really couldn't be further from the truth. Programming is to the computer scientist is like a hammer might be to a carpenter. It's a tool that we use to solve problems. You know, all computer scientists should be able to program, but just because you can program doesn't make you a computer scientist. Does that make sense? It's a tool. Um, so that's something that I want you all to kind of keep in mind as you go through the program, because I know some of you already, probably many of you, are already looking at this and saying, okay, well, I suck at programming. I'm no good at programming. I don't want to program. Whether you're a computer science major or an IT major, programming is going to be an important part of your job. You know, going IT doesn't mean no programming. Going IT means the software that you'll be writing is kind of a different purpose software. Computer science, maybe the programs you are writing are more business applications, things like that. If you are a IT person, you'll be writing programs for generating user accounts, doing system backups, things like that. Something that maybe doesn't need to visually look as nice, um, but a lot of times you're going to have some sort of analyst or graphics person creating your interfaces anyways, even in the business application world, and you're just the... You're the code monkey that just makes everything work. You know, they make it look pretty, you make it work. It's the idea. But, you know, an IT person probably wouldn't be making a lot of programs that would be user-facing. That doesn't mean you wouldn't, but they probably wouldn't be making tons of programs that would be end-user-facing. But they would be making tools kind of like this that allow them to accomplish a, a job more easily that they do all the time. Creating new user accounts, things like that. Kind of make sense? So regardless of what your major is, don't discount the value of programming, but also don't view programming as being what it means to be a computer scientist. It's a tool you have to have. So if you suck at programming, you need to put the time in and get better at it. And the only way you can get better at it is with time in. Because you will suck and suck and suck and you'll just not be good at it until finally one day it'll just click and then you'll not really suck. You'll kind of like be mediocre. And then you'll be mediocre for a while, and then all of a sudden it'll click, and you'll be, like, pretty good. And before you know it, you'll actually be a professional developer, and this stuff will seem trivial to you. Okay? But it's just like, you know, becoming a good basketball player or a baseball player or something like that. It's time in. You didn't pop out of the womb, and all of a sudden you could make jump shots. <laughs> you know, you have, you, there has to be somewhere. I mean, you couldn't build barns when you were two. <laughs> Took a few failed practice barns. <laughs> they call them practice barns. <laughs> Parents put all us youngsters out in the field. <laughs> now, do the Amish people use Lincoln Logs, or do you do you make your own Lincoln Logs? These logs. <laughs> They're just called logs. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. We just call them logs. <laughs> do you know what Lincoln Logs are? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Well, I mean, you know, I'm learning um, every year. My disconnect in age between me and my students gets greater. You know, I, I mean, I've been teaching for 15 years. So when I first started teaching college, I was 22 or 21. So I was like most of my, I mean, there's probably a couple of you who are 21 or 22 in here now. Some of you are older than that, but most of us are in like 19, 20 range, something like that. But when I first started teaching, I was like your age, um, but now I'm I'm not. <laughs> I'm older than that, and uh, um, so now I like you know I greatly remember things from when I was a kid, which was like before a lot of you were born. <laughs> so it, my perception starts changing. So I don't know what people know about anymore. You know, Lincoln Logs are something I had when I was a kid. <laughs> Who knows if you guys have even seen them? <laughs> Like, you might have seen Lincoln Logs made of Legos, but in a video game. Like, Lego Lincoln Logs. <laughs> that would be an awesome game. <laughs> Lego. What do the Amish call Lincoln Logs? We just call them logs. <laughs> we actually go and cut down the trees first and build our own logs. Okay, so can we kind of see the value in a tool like this? 
something we slap together really quick that no other person, we don't intend anybody else to see it. So they don't need to know how ghetto our interface is. Okay? But the point is, is that we can use it and quickly generate fairly powerful things. Things that would be tedious to do otherwise. You know, it's not like the contents of a web page is all that difficult. You know, there, this didn't just generate all that much code, but we can pretty easily make this a big long thing and maybe it would take us three minutes to generate it. And none of it's hard stuff. But the point is, is that it would be tedious for us to write that ourselves. Similarly, it would be tedious to go into Dreamweaver and produce the same thing. Although Dreamweaver makes it point and click, where we're just putting in zeros and ones and that kind of stuff and naming variables. So it actually makes it significantly easier for us to do because we built the tool to specifically solve the problem we want it to solve as opposed to Dreamweaver, which is solving a much more generalistic problem where if I click on this text field, I can say that this guy uh, has a variable name, username. I can decide what his character width and things like that is. If I click on password, this is how it was done. You can go from single line, which is the original, and you can toggle it over to password. So notice this is solving a much more generalistic problem. Uh, for instance, we have this drop down for a class uh, this is for cascading style sheets, CSS, which I'm not going to go into that in this class, but, you know, it's something that people use to have a consistent look and feel across their, uh, uh, their website. But this is solving a general problem for all web developers. So this is the more powerful tool, but for what we're trying to do, creating a quick little web form, our little program worked perfectly. If we need it to be a little bit more complex, we can update our program, but basically we built a tool that solves the exact problem we needed it to solve. Kind of make sense? Okay, so that's something that I want us to kind of appreciate um, as a perk of this skill. All right. So let's talk about data representation. Um, and this specifically kind of plays into um, uh, put this real quick. Oh. One moment. I've never been on Falcon Net with this laptop. All right, now I am ish. Now I am ish. Okay, Amish. 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 Ha <laughs> 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 I just got that after I said it. I'm so talented at making jokes about Amish people. <laughs> I just do it by accident. Okay, so in any case, back to data representation. Uh, what's up? Seriously, you're mumbling about the Amish. Um, so data representation. When we create our objects, um, we think of our objects as you know having a, a couple of fields, some some functions, things like that. But an object is really a data structure. Um, so let me let me start off with a slide that says data structure. So a data structure is a structure for holding data. Wow. Okay. Now, this is almost a precursor for what we're going to be running into next semester. So the next semester class is a data structure class, the uh, CSC 300, which I would recommend all of you take. Um, even UIT majors that where it says you don't have to take it, I would take it as your elective. That goes back to my argument about IT majors think they don't need programming and you do. It's important. So in any case, um, what's the benefit of an object over a primitive type? Primitive types only do what? Hold a single value. They only hold a single value and that's it. What can objects do? Well, they can, can they hold one value? Can they hold more than one value? Yeah, I, can, I can hold a whole bunch of crap, right? I can hold 20 values inside of an object if I want. 
I can have 20 different fields, first name, last name, phone number, address, blah, 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 you know, whatever I want to do. Then I can have a whole bunch of methods associated with that object so it can do special things. Make sense? So, um, a data structure is like a, well, an object is like a super variable, let's say, where we can store more than one value and potentially do more. That's what an object is. Now, a data structure, all objects are data structures in that they are built to store data. In the next course, 300, we're going to be talking about some very specific data structures that are, you know, have been invented, if you will, for storing data in a very specific way. Not that important for us, but I want to kind of um, introduce this idea of data structures by just saying it's really a synonym for what we've been calling objects. An object is a structure for holding data, organized data. So if we're going to create a customer record object, that customer record object might keep track of a customer's first name, their last name, their phone number, their address, email address, that kind of stuff. Okay, so it might keep track of lots of pieces of information. Um, where next semester, the first data structure we look at is something called a linked list. A linked list holds on to a single payload of information, but then connects it to other objects in an interesting way. It's kind of like our replacement for arrays, for a good reason. We'll, we'll talk about that next semester. But, you know, I don't want us, when we hear the phrase data structure, I don't want you to immediately go down the short list and think, oh, it's all the crap we talked about in 300. Linked lists, stacks, queues, trees, those things. Those are examples of data structures, but so are, um, so is, uh, like, for example, what do we call this? Form builder. This form builder object is also an example of a data structure. It's a data structure that holds four pieces of information, the page we're building, the footer, the body, and whatever input we took. It has a constructor that sets everything else up. It has a way to display a menu. So, you know, it's more than a primitive type, right? This is a data structure. And it does some things to make it work. Okay. Now, a problem that we often have. At some point, we're going to need to, be we're going to, need to talk about storage. We need to store things somewhere. So, for example, let's say we have a program and... We want this program, well, let's just say we have a program that uh, has a Rolodex. In fact, let's, let's, let's do this. Um, get rid of this. I'm going to create a brand new object. So I'll create a class. And we'll call this guy customer record. It's a customer record object. Okay. And what are some things we would keep track of for a customer? Well, we're going to make these all private because we should always make them as, as secure as possible, then loosen the reins if we need to. So we're going to keep track of a first name. That's a string. We'll keep track of a last name. We'll keep track of an email address. And we'll keep track of a phone number. Just for now, let's keep it to four things, okay? So that's our, uh, the e-commerce version of our customer record. <laughs> we don't need a mailing address. Who, who mails stuff anymore, right? I mean, we follow the news. We just use drones. <laughs> Moving forward. <laughs> that's going to be cool, isn't it? scary, though. Well, isn't that what the world's going towards, though? I mean, uh, the news has kind of blown it out of proportion. If you don't know what we're talking about, Amazon... Um, uh, the guy, Bezos from Amazon, had a big um, thing the other night where he was introducing how Amazon expects to do some future, um, uh, some future stuff uh, for delivery. And like for local delivery, if you're near a distribution center or something like that, where they're actually going to have this drone and they demoed it. 
that would deliver your package to your house in 30 minutes or less. It's kind of like having a pizza delivered. And there's no reason why we couldn't do this for pizzas, right? Get rid of the driver. Just have the drone deliver your pizza to your house. Um, and they said, you know, it's probably not, you know, we're at a minimum of two years away for this because you know, get to build in a bunch of crap to make sure this thing doesn't land on people's head and, you know, that kind of stuff. But the point is, is that it, it's, they have a working prototype that at least proves that it's plausible. Um, and it showed it landing on a person's yard, dropping the package off, then flying off into the wilderness. Um, <laughs> um, so, I mean, isn't this where things are going? I mean, you know, it's where we already have um, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, uh, one of the top computer science schools in the world. They have an artificial intelligence program there where they actually have a test track that cars drive themselves around that campus. Um, so how far are we away from that happening? Human beings won't have jobs at the UPS anymore because the truck will just drive itself. And then the drone will carry the package. And the, <laughs> and the drone will carry the package from there to the door. Drones will come and take your garbage out. I mean, we've already seen that, right? My garbage truck at my house comes by. A human being doesn't even get out. Nope. Pulls up right next to my street. This little thing comes out, picks it up, and dumps it in. You know, when I was a kid, you had, you know, you had, it was like a two- or three-man job. You had one dude driving the truck, and you had two other guys hanging off the back of the thing <laughs> to throw your garbage into the back of it. You know, now it's all automated. Before long, we're going to get rid of the driver. Before long, we'll get rid of the truck. Drones will just come and pick and pick up the garbage, <laughs> incinerate it on the spot, <laughs> and then vacuum up the dust and go. Get rid of my garbage. <laughs> Seriously, it'd be like laser powered. Everything will be off a satellite. You'll be paying a subscription for garbage incineration service. And you'll play play jokes on your cousin. Cousin will come over. You wrap him in garbage, shove him out the door. <laughs> 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 Gotcha. <laughs> How many times did I have to tell you not to shoot your cousin with the satellite? Well, you don't have to tell me anymore. <laughs> I never liked him anyway. Okay. So anyways, we're building our customer record. And so we'll keep track of four pieces of information. We're going to build a constructor for this guy so that we can actually create customer records. So we'll have public customer record. Notice constructors have no return type. And this guy will take in a... First name, last name, email, and phone. Let me minimize this here. Take in those four pieces of information, and we'll set this dot f name equal to f name. This dot l name is equal to l name. This dot email is equal to email. This dot phone is equal to phone. Okay, so we'll read in those four pieces of information and we'll set them to our global values. All right, and then let's go ahead and give ourselves a public method called display. And let's say this guy knows how to display a customer record. So we'll say system.out.println. This dot first name, or this dot f name, concatenated with a space, concatenated with this dot l name, and then we'll kick it down a line. We'll say system dot out dot println email colon concatenated with this dot email, then system dot out dot println phone, this dot phone. Okay, so a real simple object. Object that keeps track of four fields, four pieces of information. Has a constructor that reads in those four pieces of information and sets the private fields to those. And then a single method that knows how to display it in some sort of pretty formatted way. That make sense? Okay, so then to test this, we'll go back over to driver. We'll get rid of our form builder thing here. And we'll create a customer record, CR1. This is a new customer record. We're going to call the constructor. The constructor takes four pieces of information. It takes a first name, a last name, an email, and a phone. 
So we'll call it, we'll say Mike. Okay, and phone number would be 1900. <laughs> Have any of you even seen 900 numbers? Is that a thing of the past too? Ay, ay, ay. Okay, so I created that object, gave it the four pieces of information, then I'll say cr1.display, tell it to display itself. Go ahead and run this, and we should get that particular customer record displayed in some sort of pretty format. Similarly, we can create a second customer record. Call this one CR2, and this guy's name will be Bob Vila. Do we all know who Bob Vila is? Who doesn't know who Bob Vila is? This is again another testing thing. Who does know who Bob Vila is? So we can get some participation. Literally two people. Uh, Bob Vila is. Um, have you heard of the show This Old House? They're probably in like revision nine of it or something like that with the ninth new host. Well, the original host was a guy named Bob Vila. He was like the original do-it-yourself handyman guy at home. And now they make, you know, they reference him in shows and stuff and he's old and all this crap. But, you know, that's who Bob Vila is. So his email address is bob at vila.com. And he, in fact, does have a 900 number. All right, so we have two different customer records, CR1, CR2. We'll tell CR1 to display itself. Then we'll tell CR2 to display itself, and we'll see we get two separate records displayed. Make sense? So proving that we have data structures. So customer record is a data structure for holding information about a customer. We created it one instance of customer record to hold these four pieces of information. We created a second instance of customer record to hold these four pieces of information. Then we gave ourselves a convenience method for displaying them in some sort of reasonable format that is for human eyes only. Okay? And we get our output. Okay. Now, one issue we have, and this goes back to the storage discussion. If we are running our program and we just read in some information, so like right now we just hard coded in the first name, last name, phone, and email, but we can probably create a menu that says, you know, create new user, search for user, things like that, right? You know, so we would we we could create all of that stuff. Well, do you want to lose all the customer records that you enter in on a Wednesday when you shut down the program at the end of the day? Or when we launch the program the next day, should all that crap come back? It, it needs to come back, right? Okay, so, so we need to look at what it will take to make sure it comes back. Okay, so what are our options? So we need to store this information in some place other than memory. So default, we are storing everything by default variables are stored in RAM, random access memory, which is temporary. Temporary. That makes sense? So as soon as we end our program, all that crap's gone. So now we need to come up with another place to store our information. Okay, well, what's another place we can store information? Maybe in a file? Okay, so if you Go up, and you're doing a, a term paper in Microsoft Word, and you go up and hit File, Save As, you're saving it to a .doc file or a .docx file on your hard drive, right? So that next time you open up, you know, next time you sit down on your computer to work on your paper, you could just open up that file and pick up where you left off. You don't have to retype the whole paper. That would suck, right? The world used to work that way. Well, not quite that way, but, you know, the, there was no file saving. You had a typewriter put the lay the pieces of paper over on the side before that you had the stone chisel 
<laughs> you know, people uh, uh, who were writing their dissertations for college or term papers that were important term papers on a typewriter, if you made one little typo and you didn't want to turn it in that way, you, know, you had whiteout. Have any of you ever used whiteout? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you had you had whiteout to get rid of the, the to make it, but it, you, you do too much whiteout on a page, it starts looking pretty, pretty suspect <laughs> at best. You know, even when you had the nice fancy typewriters that literally would do the whiteout for you and just make it literally the size of the letter, like it would just type over it in whiteout, as opposed to you taking a little whiteout brush, just put just <laughs> just painting over a word with whiteout and thinking that looks good. Um, You'd have to retype the whole page to make that page look better. So it's, yeah, I mean, how the world's changed. Um, so we could store things in a file. Okay. Um, so if we're going to store things in a file, let's look at how we can do some file I.O. Go to the documentation. java.sun.com We'll go down to Java SE APIs Java SE 7 and uh, I think I'm going to use something called a print writer Let's scroll I see it's in java.io so I'll just go to java.io here and we're going to use something called a print writer. Is that big enough for us to see? A little bigger. Okay. So one of the ways we can create a file is through something that's just a file name. Okay, great. So we're going to create a new print writer with an automatic line flushing. You know, which means uh, when you write something to a file, you're writing it to it one string at a time. Well, the last thing you write might actually be stuck in memory before it actually gets out to the file. So automatic line flushing, make sure it all gets into the file. Um, and you could also create a second one that has auto flush turned on. But in any case, with our print writer, you can write to it, you can append to a file. You can either append a character, you can append a char sequence, you can append um, a char sequence from a start end, so on and so forth. So you can do a bunch of different things. You can print to it. So you can just like system.out.print, you can do system.out.print, you can do system.out.println. Uh, an interesting thing to consider here, if I go to java.lang and I go to system, And I look at out. Notice that out is something called a print stream, similar to a print writer. So if I wanted to create a print stream, I can do it with a file name. In fact, actually, why don't we use a print stream? It looks like it's just like a print writer, basically. So we'll do a print stream. So I create a print stream. So I'm making my own system.out type thing. So an interesting thing here is when you see system.out, like this right here, what can you tell me about system.out? What is system? Cat, dog, variable, class name. It's a class name. System is the name of the class. How do you know? Why do you suspect system is the name of a class? How it's called, it's capitalized. Class names tend to be capitalized, right? Okay, so if system is the name of a class, what must out be? Using the proper vocabulary. If system is the name of a class, what must out be? Go ahead. Nope. How do you know it's not a method? Or a constructor.
How do we know this guy is not a method or a constructor? It doesn't have uh, parentheses. No parameters. No parameter list. Doesn't have parentheses. Okay, so if it's not a constructor and it's not a method, it must be a what? Must be a field. Class field or instance field? How do you know? It's called using the class. Called using the name of the class. System dot out. Out must be a variable because there's no parameter list. Variables associated with objects are called fields, and it must be a class field or a static field because we're calling it using the word system. And I think we'll find right here, here's out. It's a static. So it is a class field because it has the word static in front of it at time of definition. That make sense? What is Printlin? It's a method. Printlin is a method. How can you tell? It has parameter lists. Okay. Um, class method or instance method? Let me ask you a simpler question or a starting point question for that. Who is calling the Printlin method? Out is calling it. Who is out? What is out? We said out is a variable. It's a field. It's a class field of system. Specifically, though, out, by looking at the documentation, is an instance of print stream. So while out exists only once, it exists as a class field of the system class. It in and of itself is an instance of print stream. Therefore, printlin must be an instance method of whatever class out is an instance of. And we can tell that by looking at this just because out does not start with a capital letter. We can strongly suspect that's the name of a variable, not the name of a class. Okay, so we have three levels of things going on here. We have a class named system that has a class field named out. And we can go and look it up in the documentation and see that out is a print stream. And then print stream must have a instance method called printlin that I would call using an instance of print stream. We know that this guy's a method because of the parameter list. And we know it must be an instance method because of the way it's being called from a variable. Does that make sense? Okay, so if we go into print stream, well now let me ask you this real quick. What kind of value am I passing it here? What is that? String. String. What's this one? What's this one? String. Will that work? What kind of value am I passing it here? Int. Okay, so I can pass it different kinds of values. So we expect to find more than one version of the printlin instance method inside of print stream. What's it called when we have more than one method with the same name but a different number and or type of parameters? Polymorphism. So we'll come into this class. We'll go to print stream. And we expect to find multiple prints and print lens down here. Here's our print lens. Here's a print lens that takes a boolean, a print lens that takes a char, a print lens that takes a character array, one that takes a double, one that takes a float, one that takes an int, a long. Here's one that takes an object. And when it takes an object, it calls its two string method. We've seen that, right? And another one that takes a string. So that's the one we're actually calling. So it's one of a bunch of printlin methods, and we have matching print methods for all those. Make sense? Okay, so one of the ways that we can create a print stream is using a file name. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna create a print stream. 
we'll come into just driver. Let's mess with it inside driver here. So I'll create a print stream called uh, file out. This guy will be a new print stream and we'll call this um, mydata.text. Okay. Now I'll highlight over this and we'll import print stream from java.io so we know we have access to it. Okay. Notice that this guy, uh, if I hover over it, it's giving us a, a, it's screaming at us about something and it's saying that um, this guy has an unhandled exception. Have we dealt with exceptions at all? Okay. So exceptions are the way that, um, exceptions are the way that Java handles errors gracefully. So rather than your program just crashing, certain things are prone to errors. So for instance, this one, um, can throw a file not found exception. So what we try to do, what we do is we can say try to do this crap. Catch file not found exception E. And I can say E dot print stack traces, kind of the common common output to give us an idea of what went on. So we will try to create a new print stream for a file named mydata.txt. If something goes wrong, specifically if a file not found exception is thrown, we'll print out the stack trace. So I'll go ahead and run this. Actually, click it. I, think I still expected maybe something to pop up. Okay, there's our block. So we tried to open it. Didn't have a file not found exception, which is actually interesting because it it wasn't found initially, but it created it for us. So I actually expect to go into here. Will we be able to see it on this side? Because I think it's going to be in the bin directory. So let me show you where that is. So I'm going to go into where my workspace is. And this guy is called string test. And inside bin, oh, actually, there it was. Here's the file. It creates it at this level. See it? Okay, so it created it for me. Um, so now I have it. Now, what I'll do is after I create it, I'll say file out dot. Printlin block will print something to it and then save that. So I'll go ahead and run this program again. Okay, let's run. Go back to my file. Oh, I closed the, the folder. It's fine. We'll open it again. Notice this guy now has something in it. Blah. Make sense? So let's go in. Now I want to create a way of reading stuff in from a file. Well, how do I do that? Click on java.io again. How do I read stuff in, as far as we know? 
Scanner reads stuff in. So let's go look at Scanner. Scanner is actually in java.util. So here's our scanner. So we can build a scanner, and one of the ways we can build it is by giving it a string um, for a source. I bet you that will probably work. Um, we could also give it the path to a source. Let's try just doing that with the file name. From the specified file, yeah, that's the one. So what we'll do is we'll create a scanner just like we did before. So I won't create a print stream this time. I'm going to say scanner input is equal to new scanner. And when we did what we did before is we said system.in, which is our keyboard. That was the stream we wanted to read from. But now I want to read from something called my data dot text so I'll go ahead and import java.util so notice there's a bunch of ways that we can create a scanner here's a bunch of constructors so we can create it with a file source a file character set name an input stream which is the one we used to use when we passed it system.in which is an input stream um, just to show you that real quick Take me back to system. Here's system.in. That's an input stream. Make sense? So we used to pass it, we used to use the construct that took an input stream as a parameter. But now we're going to use the one that takes a string source. And I think this should work. Okay. Now, we're going to use some methods we haven't used before. Because before, when we were using system.in, is Trista actually asleep? Are you out? I'm so tired. <laughs> so, before, we were at the mercy of whenever the user pressed enter. It was a, potentially an infinite stream of input, right? Well, now we can only read stuff in as much as there's things in the file. So, we're going to start reading in from our file. So we're just going to ask, is there more crap in here? So return true if the scanner has another token in its input. That's one thing we can do. Um, is there like a has next line? Yep. Yeah, so let's use has next line. That should allow us to ask, is there another string for us to read in um, from this file? So we'll say while input dot has next line while that's true let's go ahead and system dot out dot printlin input dot next line we'll go ahead and read that line in that makes sense now notice right now it's screaming at us that file not found exception is going to be problematic unreachable catch block for identifier uh, file not found exception. This exception is never thrown from the try statement because I'm no longer creating my print stream. So there actually isn't a possibility of me catching an exception. <clears throat> Can I make it a generic exception and will that save me? Yeah, there we go. So this is kind of the lazy way to get out of something like that. If anything in here throws any kind of exception, which actually right now it doesn't. So I'm actually wasting my time with this try catch, but I'm not going to take it out because I'm going to need it again in a second. So I'm going to say try to do all the stuff, and in the event there's any sort of exception, catch it. This is the generic, the most generic exception there is, just exception. Whatever it is, if it's a file not found exception, great. If it's a array index out of bounds exception, fine. Just catch it and do something with it. Okay. So now I'm going to read in my file, my data.txt. 
uh, well, I'm going to give myself the ability to read in from it, then as long as I have something to read in, I'll read it in and move to the next line. So this will advance the, line, the pointer. Right now my file has exactly one line in it, right? That just says blah. So the hope is, is this program outputs blah. Actually, that's interesting. It inputted the um, name of the file. Let me just do something here real quick. This is probably going to throw an exception. Yeah, no such element exception. Let me try it with just has next because we didn't have a carriage return in there. I wonder if it's not actually reading from that file. Yeah, the, uh, the path thing must not have worked out. So I actually called a different version of the constructor, one that takes a file as a parameter. And one of the versions of file, the constructor for a file, um, takes in the path name. Same thing that we kind of, how we created the print stream. So I created my scanner by passing it a new file object where the file object was built using the path to our file. Okay, and then we went through and we printed out the contents of it. All right, well now, let me comment out this code. And let's go ahead and open our file again for writing. And let's go file out dot println blah2. So we'll print out another string. Go ahead and run this. Should have printed it out to our file. I'll go ahead and open up the text document and notice now it says blah too. What happened to blah? It got overwritten. So printing to a file overwrites the entire file. Now, I can say file out dot append a character sequence of which a string is a character sequence and I can say blah three. Let's go ahead and run that. So now I appended it. Open it again, still only says blah three. What's up with that? Well, let's try appending it again. Let's append on a blah four. There's our blah four. Well, what happens if I append two things? So let's append blah five. And then blah six. So you put it blah five and a blah six, all in the same line. Okay, well what happens if I print lin? Seven and eight.
Run this again. Those are seven and eight. But once again, if I do nine and 10, run it again. My updated version of this file only has the two recent things. Well, that's not gonna quite cut it, but why not? I need to have all my crap in there, right? How do I do that? Well, let's go back and look at our print stream. So we created it with the file name. That seems to be working. So append, append something to the output stream. When would I use append instead of print? So append has, it could either take in a character or a char sequence. Print and println take one string at a time. Append allows me to keep building up characters. Kind of like I'm building a string locally, but I'm building it either one string at a time or one character at a time. Well, what does close do? Close closes a stream. Historically, we always needed to make sure we closed any streams that we opened. Java does that for us. What about write? So print stream works this way. Now let me go back and bring up our print writer. I think I was going to use initially. Dependable. Let me let me do this. So rather than print stream, let me use a print writer. I think this will give us the same behavior, but just to make sure. So I'm going to import from Java to I/O, and we'll go ahead and write blah nine and ten again. It should work the same way. Did that. Just making sure it should still say blah, 9, and 10. Actually, it doesn't because I'd have to close it. That's the difference in this one. So then I need to say file out dot close. Then I need to run it. Now it should. That row. Actually, no, it has, it has stuff in it. There it is, 9 and 10. Okay, now let's open it again and put 11 and 12. Here's my 11 and 12. Why is it doing that? We want to think about how files work. So these guys do work the same way. Um, print writer just works the way older things used to work where you actually had to close it at the end. Um, so for our, our perspective, it won't matter. We'll show both of them here. But what I'm going to do here real quick is 
is let me move to the, I think Printwriter will let me move to the end of the stream. Oh, did I lose my documentation? I closed it. Back? There we go. See, when we first open up something for writing, we are at line one. The print writer is at the top of it. So what we did is we wrote two lines, and I think, actually, can I show it this way? I think I could show it this way. Right now, the file currently has in it 11 and 12. Actually, this will test it. So I'm going to write 13 in there, but I'm not going to write the, the uh, 14. This will tell us how this guy's working. Okay, yeah, it overwrites the whole thing. That's fine. It actually makes for even a better example. So the way we're using with this print writer or print stream, it doesn't really matter, is it overwrites the entire file every single time, which means whenever we make an update to the file, we need to rewrite the entire file, correct? So if I want to have all this information, all my lines of, uh, of code, what I need to do is right off the bat, I'll open up my file for writing, and let's move back to a print stream since that's the more streams are the modern way of doing things. From our perspective in this, it just auto-closes. Okay. But I'm also going to open up my scanner. And what am I going to do? I'm going to read in every single line inside of it. And what am I going to do with it? I'm going to say file out dot println input dot next line. I'll write it right back out to that file. So I read it in, because that file gets loaded into memory, so now it's in memory, not on the hard drive. Then I'm writing it all back out to that file. Everything that's currently in the file, I'm writing right back out to the file on disk. Well, actually, it's in a separate memory location. Then I'll add anything new I want to put in there, and then when the program ends, it'll have all the old stuff plus a couple of new things. So right now, what's in there? I think is just uh, 13, right? Yeah, right now it just says blah 13. So after we write out everything that's currently in there, we're going to steal this line. We'll write out blah 14. So now when I run this, I should have a blah 13 and a blah 14 in that file. Uh -oh, hold on. Everybody relax. Well, that's not what I expected. Let's just make sure it's still reading it in. This should output the, the one line that's in there. Let's 
No, it actually isn't. I need to then close it even though it's a stream. So that should have put 15 in there. Just make sure it does have 15 in there. So now let's get a 16 in there after well, this actually won't put the 16 in there. It should display a 15, then write a 16. Let's just make sure it's reading everything in. Is it actually hitting play? Oh, interesting. We'll have to start off next time with this, but this ran into something interesting in how it works. So there's a blah 16 in there. If I run it right now, it should print out blah 16, and then I'll try to do a 17, but neither of these lines will work right now because I'm not doing a file out. But this should show my 16, I believe. The difference was is whether or not I opened up an output stream first. When I opened up the output stream, what did it do? It emptied out the file. Does that make sense? So we need to go back and look at how we do the output stream. Bottom line is what we'll have to do next time is we'll read out the whole file in, then close the file, probably read it into an array, then write it out one line at a time, and then add any new stuff in. Does that make sense? So we'll have to write a class for reading and writing to a file to save our stuff between runs. All right, I'll see everybody on Thursday.